we can turn the Romans and we'll get back on our study in there. Thanks, Brother Cunin, for filling in for me. So, Romans chapter 7, we'll pick up again verse 14. If you don't remember last time we were here, we you looked at how the, well, there's nothing sinful about the law and the commandments themselves, but rather sin within us that shows its sinfulness through the law. And really, it just works to bring about more and more sinfulness if left to itself. The law just kind of illuminates our sin and brings it to light. Really, it shows us our, our need for a Savior. What the, man, the law ultimately does it is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Paul wrote to the Galatians. And now Paul's going to begin probably some more familiar verses where he begins to describe the struggle of the, the sin that's within us, the old man versus the new man, if you will. Lord, we're going to look at verses 14 through 17 today. <clears throat> Here the Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, the soul under sin. Mm -hmm. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do not I. But what I hate, that do I. Mm -hmm. And if then I do that which I would not, I can sit under the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Amen. So Paul begins here in verse 14, the same, For we know that the law is spiritual. That is, the law deals with spiritual matters. It takes a really a spiritual understanding to rightly know the law. Mm -hmm. It goes deeper than just surface level. You know, oftentimes, the, com the commandments are seen as in our outward actions, but they really point to the inward condition of man. I think Matthew chapter 22 brings this out very clearly. I'm going to turn and read that for us. I know it's a familiar passage of Scripture. When the lawyer comes to Christ, kind of trying to get him in a, a gotcha type moment, which they often do, the Pharisees and the others of the Jews. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35. <clears throat> It says, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments and all the law and prophets. So these two commandments. Mm -hmm. Really deal with the heart of man, don't they? Mm -hmm. See, man can put on an outward show of things. Man can abstain from doing things that are known sinful and unrighteous. Man can do a lot of alms and things like that to look good in front of men, but to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and love thy neighbor as thyself, that's not something you can just pretend to. Amen. That's why Paul writes that this law is spiritual. It gets down to the, the spirit of man, what man really is. He said, thou shalt not steal. Man can control his flesh sometimes enough that he won't steal. Right. And thou shalt not commit adultery. Man oftentimes can control himself enough to not commit adultery, at least not in action but it doesn't thought many times. Right. Yeah, when you really get down to what the law really is, it's not just about the outward actions, it's about the the heart of man, man's spiritual condition. And when you see that for what it is, you'll really see yourself for what you are. That's right. But we know that the law is spiritual, he says. So the law I know it has outward manifestations of outward acts that we can do and don't do we, it ultimately the law is of a spiritual nature even if you want to reduce it just down to the ten commandments they have a, 
a spiritual nature behind them. And that's what really must be dealt with. But Paul says, we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. It is in this flesh we are carnal, we are fleshly, if you will. Not just, it doesn't just mean that we have a body of flesh, that's certainly part of it, but we have a carnal nature about us. Every last one of us does. But for the saved, we have the new man versus the old man within us. But the natural man, the carnal man, he cannot understand the things of God. Second, First Corinthians 2 verse 14 tells us that the natural man receives not the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. You might. Neither can you know them. I think that's the key to why there's lots of these heresies and false teachings out there because man is trying to interpret God's spiritual law through carnal means. You can't do those things. You end up like Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Christ was explaining a spiritual matter unto him. And what did he say? Well, how can I enter into my mother's womb a second time and be born? Right. But that's what man does with all the Word of God. <laughs> man is always looking for something he can connect to on a fleshly level, and yet the Word of God and the Law of God is a, cannot be understood carnally. So, but I think it's, it's pretty evident in this eclipse that we're having tomorrow. Everyone's wanting to predict that there's some big event or the rapture or something's going to come, and they've got some crazy people out there that try to act like they're connecting pieces of the puzzle together. They look like a madman over there with strings going every which way. Right. But we know very clearly from the Word of God that in the hourly think not the Son of Man cometh. And he also says to be ready for, you know, not the hour when your Lord doth come. Well, the carnal mind cannot understand things of the spirit. That's why you must be born again. Amen. You know, the, the world is full of all these professing theologians and seminaries and all these other things and they those things have their can have their place, but yet when they're led by men who have never been born again, they're not gonna teach Amen. the truth of the word of God. You're right. First Corinthians chapter three, though, I want us to notice something over here. That the Corinthians, they were saved folks. They were the true church of God. Yet Paul very plainly, multiple times here, calls them carnal. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 say, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither were yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you enemies and strife and divisions, and are you not carnal and walk as men? Amen. So even, even we can act carnally as the people of God, we're not careful. Paul says there that he, he had to feed them with spiritual milk rather than meat. And that's where carnality is not going to lead you to a deeper relationship with God. Amen. Being carnal is going to lead to what the Corinthians had, and they had divisions and strife among them. Mm -hmm. so that is what carnality leads to. It leads to all these things besides unity in the Word of God. It leads to all these things besides seeking the truth of the Word of God. It leads us to anything except for worshiping God. I don't want to call, I don't like to use the word church and Christian to describe some of these people that take that name, but yet there's countless churches today that are carnal in what they call their worship. Amen, amen. I'm not saying we are perfect in our worship. We could probably do things better ourselves, but yet we need to seek to be 
spiritually minded, not carnally minded. By nature, we are all carnal. If we're not careful, that carnal nature will take the lead in our lives. And Paul goes on here to say, for we know the law is spiritual by a carnal soul in our sin. Because we are as a, a slave who has been sold to a master, aren't we? And the old man is still in the power of sin. He has not been delivered from that yet. But yet that new man that's in us, it should hate the sin that remains within us. Amen. For anyone who has truly been born of God, there should be that struggle within us between the new man and the old man. There should be... We're not always going to perfectly serve God, but we should desire to serve Him. Amen. That's why I have lots, lots of questions about people who profess to be saved, and then yet they live just like the world the rest of their lives and never act like they ever experienced anything. Amen. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Paul kind of sums this up in one verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Here the scriptures say, For the, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Amen. And that's the kind of theme of the, most of the rest of the chapter here in Romans. But the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another, they're against one another, if you will. Mm -hmm. They're really in constant warfare one with another. There's an old saying, the dog, you feed the most, the one to fight. Mm -hmm. Which one do we feed the most? The spiritual man or the carnal man? Amen. The new man or the old man? I'm afraid in our, our modern American society, we're pushed to feed the carnal man a lot more than the spiritual man. Amen. Now from... Starting here in verse 15, Paul's going to begin to describe his, his struggle in the flesh. And certainly if he struggled with doing good and struggled with trying to not sin, certainly I don't think we were any better than him. I want to say none of this is an excuse to sin. Right. I can't say, well, oh, I've, I've still got sinful nature. It doesn't matter. Verse 15 goes on to say, for that which I do, I allow not. Or well, that could be, I know not. Not that he wasn't, he didn't know about it, but he wasn't familiar or acquainted with it. In the same way, that same word is used to describe how a man knows his wife. Mm -hmm. Paul was not friendly to that which he did that he didn't want to do. He was not happy, if you will, with the, the sin that was, was in his life. And neither should we be. We should not be content with doing that which we don't want to do. We shouldn't be content with not doing that which we want to do. Amen. But we do have to realize that there, there is a struggle we will face in this body. He says, for what I would that I that do not I. For that do I not. And he says the, the things which he desired to do, that he, he wasn't doing it. Amen. And that doesn't mean that Paul never did any good, did it? And Paul did I'd say a lot of good in his life. He did a lot for the cause of Christ. But yet he had a desire to do more, apparently. Mm -hmm. well, why should we be content with what little we do and say, well, I've really done something for God, haven't I? Mm. We act like that. We act as if when I made the church today, I'm doing God a favor. Mm. We act as if, well, I read my Bible today, I said a little five-minute prayer today, I'm doing really good. That's that the average American Christian today. Mm -hmm. Amen. And yet, we should not be content with such a service for God. Amen. He says he, he doesn't do, and he's, he does things that he doesn't want to do, and he doesn't do the things that he wants to do. He says, but what I hate, that I do. 
as he would find himself committing sin, doing sinful things even though he didn't want to do those things. The new man hates that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think Romans 12, 9 tells us we're to, to abhor that which is evil. Proverbs 8, 13 tells us that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Mm -hmm. Psalm 97, verse 10 tells us that if we love the Lord, we are to hate evil. We are not to have a, a good relationship with that which is sinful. You're not to just be, well, that's how it's going to be. We're not to just say, well, I've got this flesh to contend with, so it doesn't matter what I do. We should not use those things as an excuse for our sin. Going on to verse 16, he says, If then I do that which I would not, he gives a kind of a a hypothetical statement here that if I do the things I don't want to do, if that is true, then the, the next statement must be true as well. I consent under the law that it is good. I consent means to agree with or to confess. He is really agreeing and confessing that the law is good. Mm -hmm. Which has kind of been his point from the previous verses that the law is not sinful. The law is not the cause of our sin. The law is not it's not even the cause of death and suffering. Though it is, as we'll see in a moment, it is sin that is the cause of these things. The law itself is good. Really, in every aspect of it, the law is good. The law does not cause us to sin. The law does not cause us to suffer and to die. The law just simply points out our insufficiency, doesn't it? Just points out our sinfulness, it illuminates, if you will, our imperfections. We know the law itself is good, very good even. It comes from God himself. If it was a man's doings, it, could, it would be corrupt. Was, that is why we have to make new laws all the time in this country, because our laws are not perfect. Amen. Man is not perfect, man is afraid. And, you know, we get the Republicans in there, we gotta make these laws. We get the Democrats in there, they wanna make these other laws. Right. It seems to be more and more that they wanna make the exact opposite laws too of each other. Yeah, God's law doesn't need revisions and amendments and all these other things. It is good. And as we saw last week, it's good as well as holy and just. But rather, we are sinful. We are wicked, aren't we? Amen. You know what I'm saying? Verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it. And Paul's not, you know, he's not making an excuse for sin here. He's not saying, well, he's not passing the book. And, well, some people will say, or lots of people will say, actually, they don't want to take accountability for themselves. I think what Paul is saying here, he's not, it's not him doing it willfully. He is, the new man doesn't desire to do these things. The new yeah. man desires to serve God. The new man within him desires to do that which is good and to abhor that which is evil. In fact, First John chapter three. I'm going to read that for us just for a moment. First John chapter three, verse nine. This is describing the, the one who has been born again. First John 3, 9 says, Whoever or whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. Now some would take that and say, well, that means you gotta be perfectly sinless. Well, in the new man we are, in the spiritual man we Amen. are without sin. But the old man, he is still very much alive within us. That new man, he doesn't sin. He doesn't have a desire to sin. In fact, if he did, then he, I would say that you have never been truly born again because right. John very clearly says that which is born of God cannot sin. 
Ezekiel tells us very plainly in chapter 18 that the soul of sin of it shall die. No, he says rather it's not it's not I that do it, it's not this new man within me that's doing these things, but the sin that dwelleth in me. So he concludes verse 17 here. It's that sinful nature, that old man that's still within us all. That, Amen. That is where the sin in our life comes from. And this word dwell, it means to cohabit or to occupy like a, a house. The sin lives within us, but it is sin is not us. It, it occupies this flesh for now, but one day we will be fully delivered from it. Amen. One day we shall put off this mortal and corruptible body and put on a new immortal and corruptible body that's made like in his glorious body. And we'll be fully delivered from the last bit of sin. Mm -hmm. but until then, sin dwells within us. That sinful nature is still there. That's why Paul told the Philippians that he had to crucify the flesh daily. Because if we don't crucify it, if we don't bring it under control, as he tells the Corinthians, then to be sure it will war against the spirit and it will, if we're not careful, we'll overtake that and we will be led by the, the carnal mind rather than the spiritual mind. Amen. We will be led by the flesh rather than the spirit. In Matthew 26, verse 41, Christ tells his disciples to watch and pray that you enter not, to, that you enter not into temptation, but the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, certainly we are still sinners saved by grace. We should be sure that it is only grace that separates us from the most wicked of men. But at the same time, we have that new man within us and he desires to serve God. If you don't have that desire, I examine yourself. See if you really have what you think you have. Amen. But you can be sure if you try to serve God, you're going to struggle with this, just like Paul did. Strive, striving to do good and find yourself sinning instead. And doing that what you don't want to do. And not doing that what you want to do. Because mm -hmm. the flesh is weak. If we're not careful. The flesh will fall to temptation. We're not, if we don't bring it into subjection, as Paul says, then we will appear as a castle. We must really fight this fight every day. That's why he calls it the good fight of faith. And we must struggle with the flesh against the spirit. Mm -hmm. That really is the nature of being a Christian. That the old man is going to fight against the new man every day. And it's, you know, it's not all going to be a bed of roses that some people preach today. Amen. It's not really the that you just put up an offering plate and God's going to make everything easy for you in your life. That's what the prosperity gospel tries to preach. Amen. Well, anyone who truly strives to serve God, we're going to find that it's a struggle day after day. As he alludes to what Christ said in the gospel, to take up your cross daily and follow me. Amen. It's not going to be just a cakewalk. It's going to sometimes be difficult, isn't it? And Paul will continue to describe this struggle here of the, the old man versus the new man. The same nature which is in us versus the, the new nature that is given to us by God. But I promise it gets better at the end of the chapter. Amen. Jesus Christ our Lord will one day deliver us from this body of death. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and close with that thought. Mm -hmm.